Well, hi everyone, I'm Jason Kelly. So excited for this interview. This is one of these conversations that just sort of makes me look a lot cooler than I am. So happy to welcome Katie Ledecky. Katie, this is just one of these interviews, these conversations where I'm, you know, chatting with people about what I'm up to and they're like, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, who? Who are you talking to? So uh, thank you so much. You're, you're a big deal and we're really honored to have you a part of this. And listen, you're sitting in the middle of some of the biggest issues of our time. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I know we're supposed to talk about the year ahead, but let's talk about the year behind if we can j just for a minute. It obviously did not go the way anybody expected, but certainly for you as an Olympian, tell me what it was like, what it was like to sort of go through 2020. A lot of things did not go the way you thought they would. Yeah, well, the first couple months were fine. Everything was trending in the right direction. I was swimming some of my fastest times I had in a while, and I was really feeling excited and, and prepared for the Olympic Games and the Olympic trials beforehand um, that were to come in the summer of 2020. Uh, but just after my last meet, which was in early March, uh, that next week, everything shut down. So those next few weeks, there was a lot of uncertainty. All of the pools and training facilities were closing and we hadn't heard about the Olympics yet, what was gonna happen. Ultimately, I think by the end of March, they had made the decision that it was gonna be postponed but I trained in a backyard pool for about three months, and it was just a, a neighbor's backyard pool. It was a pretty nice backyard pool, so I was able to get some, some good laps in. Uh, but I was doing that, doing my lifting in my apartment, and just trying to, to stay safe like everyone else. And my normal training facilities opened back up in late summer, and so I've been training since then just in my, my normal training environment. A lot of different things with testing and social distancing with my teammates, swimming one per lane and all that. So I'm, uh, I'm just staying put and hoping that I can get to some competitions really soon because we're gearing up for another Olympic summer, hopefully. Right. Yeah. Hopefully being the, the operative word. I mean, we're, you know, we're speaking uh, on a day where it it's still going ahead as, as far as we know. How do you stay focused given that there is a, a lot of uncertainty out there about the Olympics specifically? Well, my, my focus is just on the fact that they're happening and you can't control anything else. And I want what's best for our country and our world, and I want it to be a safe Olympic Games if the Olympics do happen. But I have to fully prepare like it's any other Olympics because I don't want to have any regrets uh, if I get to the Olympics and I, I don't feel fully prepared. So I'm kind of blocking out a lot of the speculation. I think there will continue to be speculation over the next couple of months. So I'm, I feel like I'm prepared for that, and I feel like I can just stay focused on my training and keep moving forward. I know it's going to look different probably uh, no matter what this summer. So uh, I just know that I'll have to adapt to any of those little changes and be ready to race. So we'll, before we move off the Olympics, you know, I have to ask you, I mean, I look at the Olympics as a fan. I got a chance to cover uh, the 1996 games as a cub reporter. I mean, it's a phenomenal thing for any of us to be involved in. Tell us something about being in it, like what? What do you? What can you tell us that that sort of takes us inside the the culture of it all? Because there is this significance to it that I think we all appreciate, but we certainly don't appreciate it from the perspective of a gold medal winner. Yeah, you know there are some elements to it that I think are almost just like what you see on TV. Like I remember in 2012, I was 15 years old and. Not all the swimmers go to opening ceremonies because it's right before the swimming competition, but my race wasn't until later in the week. So I got to walk in opening ceremonies. And I remember walking through the kind of tunnel into the Olympic Stadium and just getting those goosebumps. And they were the same goosebumps that I would have gotten if I was watching them on TV. So it, it felt surreal and it felt crazy, but it also felt like I, I knew that environment because I always loved 
watching the Olympics on TV. And then I think I, I just love some of those behind the scenes moments of interacting with athletes from all over the world. Uh, it really does bring everyone together and you might be sitting in the cafeteria across from some athletes from another country and on the bus next to some other athlete from another country. And uh, it, it's always fun to have those small little conversations and get to know uh, different cultures and different people. And so, you know, when you think about communities of, of athletes, you know, one element that I definitely wanted to talk to you about that has become so core, it feels like, to the conversation around sports is college athletics. And, and obviously, you had a very successful career there uh, at Stanford as well. And yet, I feel like there are these big, big existential questions around NCAA athletics. Tell me about that and, and your experience and, and where you see college athletics going. Yeah, I, I competed two years in uh, the NCAA for Stanford for the swim team, and I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. We won two national championships. It was uh, Stanford has a really great legacy of uh, national championship swim teams, but it was our first national championship in, I think, 19 years that we won in, in 2017. So that was really exciting to be a part of. And I just, I just I found so many new friends through college swimming, both on my team and on other college teams. And I don't think I would be the swimmer I am today if it if it wasn't for that experience. And I'm continuing to train with the Stanford collegiate team alongside a couple other professional swimmers. Um, but I, I loved it. And I'm uh, it's it's hard to see how some colleges are cutting sports and especially swimming in in a couple um, a couple schools. So it's tough, and I really hope that college swimming and college athletics can continue to grow and that there can continue to be those opportunities for young athletes to reach for. And so what's your reaction specifically, you know, at Stanford? I mean, they've had to to cut sports there, which I think everybody, knowing the rich uh, history there. I mean, 27 Olympic medals, I believe, you know, in the sports, the 11 sports that that were discontinued. I mean, that must be difficult, even though swimming is, is obviously continuing at Stanford, but it must be difficult to sort of comprehend in, in many ways and, and to see a group and, and a, a school that's been so successful in, in all aspects uh, have to make those sorts of decisions. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's difficult uh, to to see fellow athletes, student athletes, and coaches, and uh, all these different people affected by those kinds of decisions. Uh, but I realize that those are very difficult decisions that aren't being aren't being taken lightly. And I'm sure the athletic directors around the country are, you know, heart heartbroken that uh, they have to do that in in certain cases. So. Um, I'm heartbroken for those athletes affected, um, and I realize that these are really difficult decisions and a lot of different factors go into play when trying to make those decisions. Do you think we need to rethink certain aspects of, of college athletics, again, having lived it? I mean, are there things that we should be thinking about as, like, mortals, you know, non-college athletes or, you know, just college students and supporters of different universities? Like, how, how should we be thinking about this differently in your estimation? I don't know. I mean, there are, there are so many different conversations, I think, that are happening in terms of amateurism and professionalism with, with collegiate athletics and I don't know the answer to it and uh, you know I, I lived through it I, I there was a lot of speculation of whether I should just go pro right from the start and not go to college or what what should I do um, but I made the decision I made because I really believed in the value of making those friends being a part of that team and having that camaraderie and and really growing in the sport through college athletics um, but yeah I had to deal with all of the uh, the compliance issues and running everything by compliance whenever there was a question. Uh, I won, uh, the, fun the funniest story is I won a waffle maker on the Ellen show for winning the game that we played. And on the show, I, I turned it down because I was concerned that accepting that would be in violation of uh, NCAA rules. So uh, there, there are little things like that that uh, probably don't seem like big things, but uh, they're things that college athletes are 
always thinking about and always trying to stay within those those rules. A, a, a waffle maker too, like that. that I, I love waffles, so I, that must be hard to turn down <laughs> in some ways. But having to know those rules, I mean, it just is amazing to to have to, have to uh, to think about uh, all those things. So, waffle makers notwithstanding, you know, how do you think about your your business and sort of your brand? You know, especially as you develop it, uh, you know, as a professional, as you think about you know the years to come and and what you stand for and what you want to back? Yeah, I've really enjoyed being a professional athlete the last couple of years and growing into it and, and really learning along the way. And I've been able to partner with some really great brands, uh, both some Olympic sponsors and non-Olympic sponsors. Um, my swimsuit, uh, swim gear sponsor, Tier Sport, they've been a, a really great partner uh, for my swimming and, and have really uh, they really launched me into my professional career. And I've been able to partner with a lot of brands that give back, which is really important to me, um, giving back to the community. I've been able to partner with Panasonic and do some things around STEM education and really inspiring some middle schools and uh, uh, high schoolers around the country to focus on, on STEM education and pursue their goals. Um, and I think it, it always uh, has to be something authentic to me, something that I, I use, something that I value, brands that I, I really love. And so far, I've, I really feel that personal connection with all of the brands I've been able to partner with, which has been awesome. And when you think about, again, this is a little bit of, of both the year behind, but also the year ahead, obviously, you know, many athletes, stood up in a way that maybe they hadn't before, or certainly more broadly as we wrestled with some long overdue uh, issues around injustice and racial inequality. Do you feel more responsibility, I guess, now, especially as a professional athlete, to, to be active or to be vocal around certain issues? How, how do you take on that part of, of your public persona? Yeah, for sure. I, I think every athlete is feeling more comfortable with that, given how it seems like more athletes are uh, getting getting behind certain causes and speaking up and not being afraid to do so. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely trying to use my platform for good. I think I always get asked now that I'm finished with college, like, what are you going to do next? And I always come back to uh, giving back and helping others. And so that's always going to be at the core of, of what I do. And I've really enjoyed the opportunities I've had through swimming and through this platform that I've had to be able to give back. And I've identified some of those areas where I can really give back and make a difference. And I'm going to continue to uh, lead in those areas and, and try to really uh, make a difference where I can. One of the interesting things that even just looking at your Twitter feed is uh, that the your your sports family connection sort of creep in as well. You're an Islanders fan uh, for obvious reasons. I believe your your uncle uh, is one of the owners of of that team. So how do you think about sports sort of holistically having that window into professional sports, not just uh, the swimming world? Yeah, you know, we always kind of joke, but I, I don't think it's a joke, really, because I, I actually think this is a serious thing that my uncle kind of introduced me to professional sports. And from a very young age, I was going to Washington Capitals games when he was uh, a minority owner there. And just meeting all these athletes uh, when I was, was younger, I think, kind of gave me a glimpse into what it's like to be a professional athlete. So, yeah, I, I'm a big Islanders fan. I was watching the game last night. Uh, always staying in touch with that and going to games when I can. Hopefully we can get back to some uh, pro sports games uh, moving forward here soon. Well, people are very excited here in the New York area about the, the future of that team yeah, and the yeah. brand new arena. I mean, it's a big deal, right? It is, yeah. My uncle is always sending us updated pictures of the arena, and I know he's really excited about what it's going to do uh, for the Long Island fan base and for the community as a whole. 
And so, I mean, on that note, what do you think we have learned and what do we carry forward, you know, from the pandemic and some of the disappointments around sports and then the revival of some sports, albeit a little bit different? What have we learned about sort of sports and, and culture? I would imagine this is something that you thought about at Stanford, you think about as an Olympian, because it is a, it, it's an elevated conversation in many ways, it feels like, the way we look at sports. Yeah, it is. And I, I think over the last year, I think you've realized how much sports is uh, sort of a, a very focal, uh, central element of our entertainment. Uh, a lot of people are at home and they love watching watching sports on TV. I know when there weren't really any sports for a couple months, everyone felt like there was this big loss in their lives. They weren't able to watch their favorite teams. Uh, so it was really nice when some sports started coming back. and. I think it showed that we can, um, you know, I, I think sports are resilient in the way that they were able to uh, adapt to these circumstances. Athletes are definitely very resilient and kind of built for having to adapt and and kind of roll with the punches. So I think it's shown a lot about, uh, about athletes and about uh, sports in our culture, as you said, just being a, a very central central part of a lot of people's lives. And so, yeah, I want to go back to something you said a couple minutes ago about professional athletes. And, you know, you've had a chance to see some of them up close and personal, whether in an Olympic village or, or as you say, through, you know, some of your family experiences as well. You're going to have a long career of, of being well known and but presumably you won't swim professionally forever. As you look at other Olympians or other athletes and, and their post uh, sports life, or are there people you think about and, and you think, yeah, I want to emulate that, or, you know, I'm going to take a, a piece of that playbook. Who, who do you role model in that respect? Uh, I don't know if there's one specific person I would point to. I think I, I try to take in as much as I can from lots of different athletes. And I hope that I can stay connected to the swimming world and the Olympic world in many different ways as I get older and eventually when I retire from competitive swimming. Uh, but I also know and, and feel like since I've gotten such a great education at Stanford that I can also do some other things uh, in, in the world besides being connected to sports. So uh, I'm excited to kind of start that chapter at some point as well. And uh, I, I think I'll always be connected to sports in some way, but uh, I, I know that there are some other avenues out there as well. All right, so Katie, before I let you go, we got to talk about Got Milk, chocolate milk on your head in the pool last summer. Everybody, literally everybody saw it. You got to tell me the backstory to that. Yeah, so as I was saying earlier, I, I partner with brands that I believe in and that I use, and I've been drinking chocolate milk since I was 11 or 12 years old for my recovery after swim practices. And so when, when the chocolate milk team came to me and asked if I could do something fun in the pool with the chocolate milk, I said, let me just get in the water and, and play around, try some things out. I said, you know, I, I told them a few of my ideas, and then I said, if we're being really ambitious, I could try swimming with the chocolate milk on my head. And I said, I don't know if I can do it. I've never done it before. I'll, I'll give it a try. So I practiced a few times with just the cup of uh, uh, pool water. I filled it up with pool water to see how I would do. I didn't want to waste any chocolate milk at first. <laughs> uh, so I, I felt confident enough doing it with the, the pool water. I made it across one or two times. And so I said, all right, I'm going to give it a go with the chocolate milk. And I, I made it on the first try. The video I posted was my first try. I think I did it two or three more times after that. And I was stunned at the reaction. I, I kind of thought it was a cool video and that people would like it, but I had no clue it would go viral globally in the way that it did.